So my name's Ed Burns, and I um, came here all the way from the United States. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to Code Europe, and I'm happy to kick it off. <clears throat> Being from the United States, uh, I feel it's uh, my duty as a citizen to start out the uh, session with a little political statement, a brief political statement. Um, so if you'd be interested in seeing my brief political statement, just Google for Ed Burns' personal blog, and I put a little blog post with that. <clears throat> so let me begin. <clears throat> this is how I plan to spend our time t together. I'm glad you came to uh, this talk. I know there's a lot of other great talks going on at the conference, and uh, I appreciate you choosing this one. <clears throat> I'd like to start out by giving what's my idea of a rock star programmer, or even an above average programmer, cover a little bit of prior art. Um, certainly, uh, <clears throat> I'm not the first person to explore this topic, and uh, many have explored it in the past, and many will continue to explore it, because the topic is how do we as programmers, as developers, as IT professionals um, <clears throat> do our jobs and do them better and um, do them for a very long time. If you would like to have a full career out of uh, doing programming in an industry that changes so quickly over time, um, how do you do that? Because it's not like you can just learn one set of skills and then keep using them for the rest of your earning potential career. You have to learn to <clears throat> be a professional learner. <clears throat> so um, I explore this theme in the book right here, and I have a few copies. If you're curious for a sale, come see me afterwards. Uh, I'll set up a little booth outside. You can get a copy if you like. Uh, the categories of secrets. What do I mean by secret here? And uh, then, of course, looking at the problem with categories. One of my concerns in giving a talk that's very advice-focused is um, it's advice, right? One of the great things about technical topics, most of the sessions here at Code Europe are on technical topics, um, is you can't dispute it. Right? It's, you learn the technique, you can do it. Uh, with these kinds of talks, advice-based, um, a lot of times you'll see throughout the talk today, I'm going to play one thing and then uh, give a counterpoint argument. So I am not a rock star programmer myself. I've talked to them and interviewed them. So um, I hope to approach this with humility there. So in my opinion, what is a rock star programmer? It's, first of all, it's a totally subjective assessment. Um, I believe it's someone who has a good mix of all the skills, uh, someone who most importantly is not a jerk, someone you'd really work hard to hire onto your team, or if you are a regular developer and you are um, choosing or have the opportunity to choose where you want to go within an organization, this is someone whose team you'd work really hard to join. Um, a lot of the times, particularly in larger organizations, I've found that uh, people who um, are really good programmers and good leaders sort of gravitate, uh, people gravitate to them. They, they sort of follow them and seek them out and that's what a rock star programmer is in my opinion. This is a movie from 1983 that I'm a big fan of called Buckaroo Banzai and His Adventures Across the Eighth Dimension. And the hero of this book uh, is a guy who is a brain surgeon, uh, a rock star, uh, a ninja, um, an FBI investigator type guy, and also a, uh, a test pilot. So you have to have a lot of different skills, in my opinion, to be considered a rock star programmer and bring them all together. More recently, in fact, just uh, today, uh, this guy here, Vala Afshar, he's the chief digital evangelist from Salesforce. He was speaking at uh, Amazon reInvent, and uh, he came up with a nice list. If you look at his Twitter feed, it's all of these kinds of lists here. And when I saw this, I'm like, well, that's very similar to what I was thinking about, too. Uh, but it comes a few, uh, there's a few other points there, you know. Um, the one I want to bring out there is uh, stay teachable. Uh, that's what I mentioned with the current with the, our industry, the currency of our industry is learning. And so you have to be able to teach yourself, but also be able to learn from others. Um, and that uh, is a really important thing. Number five, I like that, help others, you become the latter. I believe the measure of success of any leader is how well did he or she help the people uh, that they were leading progress and grow in their own careers. Um, there was a, a famous story about uh, this old American rock band called The Velvet Underground with Lou Reed, and uh, their first album didn't sell a lot of copies, but um, anyone who bought it went on to form a band. So if you're not you know, commercially successful or, or 
um, successful by the measures of, uh, common measures of success. If you're a good leader, the people that you lead are going to go on and do great things. Quickly looking at prior art, uh, a few books that I recommend checking out. Uh, these are both out of print. Uh, you can tell from how they look. Um, but they're, this one, Programmers at Work, uh, is, in my opinion, one of the first of this kind of book. And that's, you know, interviews Bill Gates when he was a programmer. So that's how old that is. It also talks to uh, Charles Simonyi and uh, the guy who did uh, Pac-Man. You can see that up on the upper uh, right of the screen there. So that's a good one to check out. Another one is this Out of Their Minds book. That's quite nice. Um, now, we've defined what a rock star programmer is. What do I mean by secret? Really, it's a character attribute or a habit. Uh, so that's, that's what I mean there. So for the purposes of this talk, I've decided to break the secrets down into ancient secrets and modern secrets. Uh, in the book itself, I have a uh, more fine-grained categorization scheme where it's all broken down and you can sort of search by index to see character attributes and I've talked about software technology experts, software pedagogy experts, software development experts, um, different kinds of what do you, why would you be considered, what's your claim to fame to be a rock star programmer. But for a talk like this, I wanted to make it a little simpler grouping. So one of my favorite rock star programmers, of course, is James Gosling. Uh, he is the, credited as the father of Java, <clears throat> and I had a chance to talk, work with him uh, during my time at Sun and also had a chance to interview him for the book. So I asked him what he thought about categories. There's this goofy Nietzsche quote that shows up in Wayne's World, <laughs> something like, you know, if you label me, you, you nullify me or something. <laughs> and I need to label him things. Cool. Okay. Um, if only because it, it, it you know, the, the labels become the thing that, that, that define the universe. Yeah. And for me, the really interesting stuff is the stuff that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. The big piece of the sort of programming culture these days where their entire universe is the stuff that generates HTML pages. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that goes onto those HTML pages, you know, mm -hmm. pieces of JavaScript and all that, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And, it, and it's like, guys, don't you realize you're like in like this tiny little corner of, of, of things. Mm -hmm. There is so much more cool software out there. Mm -hmm. And that was a, an interesting sort of rebuke to me. So as I was talking to James, my job at the time was working on a web framework called Java Server Faces that did exactly that, JavaScript HTML pages. So I agree with him, uh, but it also was like humbling to hear him say that and say, yes, you know, I know it is important to look broader. Uh, so James is wary of categorization. As soon as you come up with a top 10 list of things, uh, then you leave out all the other people that could be on that list. Now, another expert I talked to was Adrian Collier. He's one of the original guys uh, at Interface 21 and then Spring and VMware. Uh, he has a very good um, blog that's out there called the Daily News and uh, or the Morning Report, I think. It's Morning Paper. That's what it is, Morning Paper. Um, and he's moved on from uh, the Spring world. Uh, now he's become successful and he's a venture partner. Uh, so I asked him what he thinks of categorization, and here's what he had to say on that. I guess one of the things about our industry, and actually one of the things that attracted me to it, is um, it's always changing. There is just an enormous amount of new stuff flying past you all the time. You have to have some way to sort of systematize, tag, understand, file, make sense of all that immense stream of data flying past you. Okay. And if, you, if you've got a way of, you know, even at the first crude level, pigeonholing what something is and putting it in a bucket, that's your very first crude cut, understanding what on earth is going on. Um, so that's, that's one pretty important reason why you want to be able to categorize. Um, so there you go. You've got two opposing views to the question on the value of uh, categorization. Uh, one other thing I want to do with James further is... Uh, the first secret we talked to about uh, is humility and celebrity. So I asked James, how does it feel to be known as the father of Java? Well, various people have tried to do that. And uh -huh. any time I've been asked, I've said, no! Okay. Um, but it kind of subversively happens. Uh -huh. So how do you feel about being that way now? It's sort of a mixed bag. I mean, uh -huh. I'm, I'm more uncomfortable in, 
anything else. And, you know, it still feels kind of weird when people recognize me in the street, in the damnedest places, and I have no clue who they are. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, when you meet somebody in the street, you know, and they know you and you have no idea who they are, you know, I, I always go, gee, is this like some old friend from high school that I had to remember, uh -huh. or is this just like some completely random person? Right. It's often hard to tell. Right. Okay, so now let's get into the meat, or the ancient secrets. These uh, are what I've distilled from the book as things that have been true since at least the dawn of civilization, right? Having the right balance between uh, humility and pride, being aware of your own ignorance, uh, being a good collaborator and recognizing and um, cultivating the importance of collaboration, being hooked into a good invisible college, and of course, luck. So the first ancient secret, uh, pride tempered by humility here. Um, you know, the dangers of hubris. Uh, there's a quote from this uh, I found here um, on an old rabbi here. Every person should have two pockets and one there should be a note that says, for my sake was the world created. And in the other there should be a note that says, I am but dust and ashes. To have the balance of those two things where you know you're good at something, but you have the knowledge to know that you're not like, there's always someone who's better at it than you. So I talked to Rod Johnson, who was the creator of the Spring Framework about this topic, and let's hear what he had to say about it. I've very seldom seen a highly successful software developer who didn't have a fair degree of ego. Okay. And I think it does seek to motivate. It, okay. it serves to motivate. The question is whether or not um, there's the insight, the uh, metacognition, that it's getting in the way. And I think it's absolutely vital that people can cope with being wrong and being, admitting being wrong. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I have seen, you know, I mean, the majority of good developers I've seen, or outstanding developers, did have, you know, probably bigger than average egos. Huh. Achieving outstanding things very often does involve feeling that you know better huh. and acting on it. All right, so there you go. Um, and he did. Uh, I know Rod personally kind of as a friend but also as somewhat of a nemesis because um, the people who advocated and continue to advocate for Spring, uh, it's a great technology but they always advocated it um, sort of as a counterpoint to what we were working on at Sun and at Oracle and you know in the JCP, not just Sun and Oracle, uh, IBM and Red Hat and all the other players in the Java EE community. Uh, so feeling that you know better, his first book was about you know uh, uh, EJB without J2EE and uh, that was how he built the spring project is like okay I can do it better than what those guys are doing and you can see the results um, and so it's important to have that and act on it but the humility is important too <clears throat> another great one uh, that I like to point out of the great story is uh, the awareness of your own ignorance uh, in the ancient world here uh, Socrates uh, contests the oracle's claim that he is the wisest man so the oracle says, hey, Socrates is the wisest man in the world. And uh, he wants to understand, well, why is this? How is this possible? He goes out and interviews a lot of people, and he finds that none of them are aware of their own ignorance. So in some sense, Socrates concludes that the oracle is right because of all the people he found, he was the only one who had that important the, uh, understanding of humility. So here is a very interesting categorization scheme about the uh, ignorance. It's called the Five Orders of Ignorance from a very old edition of Communications of the ACM magazine. And this is something that we deal with all the time in, in computers. A everything in IT is in this graph or this list here. So zeroth order ignorance is lack of ignorance. Um, I know uh, Java and I know what things Java is good for and I can use it and I know how to use it to solve problems. Um, first order ignorance is lack of knowledge. Uh, well, I might know that there is uh, some things that Java is not good for, um, and I might know that Kotlin is a better choice for my particular problem, but I don't know Kotlin personally, so I can go out and learn Kotlin and reduce first order to zeroth order. Uh, second order of ignorance is lack of awareness. You have a problem, but you don't know uh, that Kotlin is the right answer. So you have to find out first what's... How can I solve the problem, reduce two to one, and then say, ah, Kotlin might be a great choice, and then reduce one to zero. Um, 
The important difference there is in second order ignorance, you're not aware, but you have a great way of discovering that you're not aware and doing that reduction. Third order ignorance is the real interesting thing, and that's where most of the fun software happens. It's um, lack of a su suitably efficient process to get to second OI. So you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know that you don't know how to find out that you know that. You don't know that, rather. So uh, you do sort of grope around in the dark until you can reduce it to second and uh, then go on from there. Because once you get down to second, you know, you're, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, thankfully, with the web and with Wikipedia and with Stack Overflow and all of those resources where the collective knowledge of uh, everyone is sort of put out there, if you have the ability to sift through it all, which I'll talk about uh, later on, the Invisible College can help you with that, um, you can really not have a problem with 3OI. And the fifth order of ignorance, fourth level, uh, is meta-ignorance, and that is ignorance of the orders of ignorance. So you no longer have that. You've been explained to. Being aware of your own ignorance is crucial to everyone, mm -hmm. and that's not particular to, to software development. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you're a writer or you're, you know, flipping burgers in a McDonald's. Okay, you know, okay. You've got to be aware of your own ignorance. Okay. And not be ashamed by it. I mean, right. it's not like everybody knows everything. Right. Well, being metacognitive, um, aware of your ignorance is one type of this kind of metacognition. Um, how much of the time uh, in your day-to-day -day job do you spend thinking about how you're doing, thinking about your thinking process. How Almost not. Almost not. So you're mostly in the mode, in the flow state kind of. Absolutely. Okay. So that's one thing he's famous for, is kind of being in his Java cloud flow state, uh, inventing new things. Um, I talked to this uh, woman, Jennifer Pipas, uh, when I gave this presentation at a conference in Chicago earlier in April. Um, she is uh, a, a teacher and she teaches media studies and production at a university in Chicago and she was giving a talk and I at, at the same conference so I interviewed her and wanted to see about her uh, take on this ignorance topic. Jennifer Pipas. The interesting thing for me was like being in this really small focused group of, of grad students was that there were people that had incredible skills like far ahead of me and mm -hmm. how they did what they did mm -hmm. but nobody in the class was like good at everything. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to feel unconfident when you see somebody like doing something that you don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. But then there were things that, like just realizing that, oh wait, there are things that I know how to do that they don't know how to do. The things that they know how to do that I don't know how to do, I can learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the things that I know how to do that they don't know how to do, I can teach. Like working with people who are better than me at stuff raises my level, but don't under like I shouldn't undersell myself because when we got to like screenwriting and stuff, there were people that really struggled with that, and I was like, oh, this is I got this. Okay, um, here is a funny anecdote from Rod uh, about knowing when to step away from the keyboard. Uh, one of the characteristics that I've seen a lot of the programmers have is kind of an almost obsessive compulsive disorder level of focus on things. And I really struggle with this myself. Um, it's almost like if you're playing a video game and you're at the boss level and you really want to beat the boss. You just want to, you can't let it go. And you might have something else you have to do, but you're, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to beat the boss. And the same thing happens, you know, if you've got a, a tough programming problem or, or you're up against a deadline and you have to get something fixed. So uh, here's a funny anecdote from Rod about it. I remember when I was at university, we... We're in third year, there were four of us doing a software engineering project, which was actually um, writing an equivalent to VI that accommodated multiple windows. And we were about a day away from the turning the thing in, and it just started crashing constantly. And we couldn't, didn't know where it was. And, I mean, we were pretty desperate because, I mean, the, the first process of the marking was automated. So we would have got zero um, for, like, a semester's work for four of us. So we spent a lot of time looking for it. Uh, couldn't find it. The, you know, and even myself and the other guy who, you know, was the second best of the, the group, we were pretty desperate. So eventually I went to 
the bar and had a few beers and then mm. Matthew was kind of thinking, oh my God, you know, probably Rod's more likely to find it than anyone else and he's, you know, it looks like he wants to get drunk. But, you know, I, it may have been just dumb luck, but, you know, I had a couple of beers, two or three beers, um, went back and I found it within half an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't think alcohol is the way to do it, but I don't think we were going to get a solution without changing something. Mm-hmm. You know, there are better ways to think differently. Mm-hmm. Um, like go and have a workout, go and listen to some music. You know, you may not have the luxury. You know, you may be fixing a production problem that's costing you your company money. Right. You may not have that luxury. Right. If you do, try to step away from it. You can easily get into a mode where you're not productive. So that's the important metacognition thing, remembering when your productivity level goes down and, and that's when it's time to step away. <clears throat> um, this didn't show up correctly. Uh, this, is, this gentleman is Nikhil Katari. He is one of the people at Microsoft. He's now at Google, uh, but he was one of the main people behind ASP.NET and Silverlight. And um, his thing was knowing, when, knowing how to question conventional wisdom. This is another aspect of thinking you know better than everyone else who says this is the right way to do it. I kind of put that in the bucket of uh, being critical. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to be able to question when your gut feeling tells you that this isn't like the right thing. Mm-hmm. You have to have that sense of intuition. Otherwise, I think that's what separates the programs to write code as opposed to someone who programs to actually create a solution. Okay. Uh, collaboration is another important ancient secret, and from the ancient world we have the example of Odysseus and his crew um, <clears throat> in the Odyssey collaborating to get back home. The problem with Odysseus is that he's the only one that survives, so he's in some sense the original pointy-haired boss uh, because he's the leader, but you know, ends, everyone else on his team ends up dying before they solve the problem. So not the best example. Um, but Aeneas uh, from the Aeneid and his survivors uh, found the city of Rome. So collaboration is super important. Um, I talked to James and Andy Hunt, one of the founders of the Pragmatic Programmers, about this. And, um, you know, James felt the fit gets rarer as I get crankier with age. And I, I can see this myself. The more gray hair I have, the harder I find I have to work to be easy to work with. Um, Now, Andy Hunt, uh, he does a lot of consulting uh, with Agile, right? And so I asked him, what does he do if he comes into a team and he finds that the collaboration is the main thing or the first thing that he has to solve? What does he do? Um, We get, I get him to talking. I mean, uh, anytime I've gone and consulted to a team where they've had, you know, those sorts of communication issues Mm -hmm. in in between themselves, um, the number one thing that seems to help is something like a scrum stand-up meeting mm-hmm. where it's, it's a daily meeting, it's very focused on the agenda, you, you answer your three questions and you get the hell out of there. It's not you know, some lengthy uh, meeting or discussion or diatribe. You don't problem solve, mm-hmm. you don't discuss. It's just you, know, you answer the, the scrum three questions. Here's what I'm doing today. This is what I was doing yesterday. Here's what I plan to do tomorrow. You know, here's what's in my way. And the idea is whatever's in your way, the manager takes as his to-do list, and, you know, you just go bop, 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 bop around the room, and now everyone knows what everyone else is working on. Mm-hmm. You get a sense of everyone's pace, everyone's velocity, a really, really effective way just to get everybody, you know, playing on the same page. That, to me, is the number one way to sort of kickstart getting a team to communicate with each other is to make them do it. So um, Andy is also a musician, and uh, he tells a joke where um, a guy has got his instrument case, and he's walking around the streets of New York, and he's looking to go to Carnegie Hall, but he doesn't know how to get there. Carnegie Hall is a famous performance venue. And he sees someone, and he asks him for directions, and the guy says, how do I, can you please tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? And the guy looks at him in the eye and says, practice, man, practice. So you just got to keep doing it, keep trying. Now, this gentleman here is Brian Cantrell. He's the CTO at Joyent, and um, he is one of the main people that's contributed to the success of the Node NPM community and the Node.js community. And I asked him, uh, you know, how does he feel about the growth, uh, the explosive growth of the Node community, and how does that, uh, how does he evaluate that? Why did it grow so fast? I think growth gets um, overly fetishized. Mm-hmm. I think people will kind of fantasize about growth, but growth has got a, a lot of problems that come with growth. 
And in, I think that if, if a community is growing but its values become divergent, that growth can actually become very problematic. And we certainly saw this in Node. You've seen this in a lot of other communities as well. The communities end up growing so much so fast that they end up fracturing on those kind of value and fault lines. Um, so honestly, I've come to really treasure small communities. I'm a big small community fan. Um, I like small communities because they often self-select in by those values. And they, to me, they feel uh, more intimate and more, um, they're more interesting in, in because you've got a kind of the, this foundation of shared values and there's just less infighting. And, you know, because so there's a huge spectrum of community that's out there. Um, and, you know, I, I tend to find myself as I get older gravitating more towards the smaller ones mm -hmm. and uh, being a little less interested in growing communities purely for its own sake. Um, okay, so I also talked to uh, Brian about um, what do you do if you're, you know, on the growth side of building a team and building a, a company. Um, sometimes when you have a lot of emphasis placed on quick hiring, uh, you might end up making some higher choices that you ultimately come to regret. <clears throat> uh, how do you mitigate those effects? Yeah, and it, your mishires are really expensive. Um, they're really tough. And, you know, especially when you're in a high growth mode and you're hiring a lot of people, um, you're going to have mishires. And, you know, everyone loves to say that we're going to hire, hire fast and fire fast. And I have never found that to be true. I have found that, I mean, you, I guess you might have some cases, I've never had one of these, where you hire someone who is so unequivocally poisonous that there is just zero doubt in anyone's mind that this person should not work there anymore. Um, what's much more common is something more nuanced, where you have someone come in and who has strengths, but also has weaknesses that maybe you didn't anticipate. And those weaknesses begin to affect the people around them. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's someone that comes in that, you know, seems like a really earnest technologist, but all of a sudden starts thinking politically. And those kinds of issues get really complicated and nuanced very quickly, especially if you've got someone that's a, you know, well-meaning or hard-working individual. They've got, you know, these traits that are positive, but you also see these very significant traits that are, that are really tough. And I have always tried to be um, very honest and direct in my assessment of people and be willing to have tough conversations. No, I think anyone who is, who is kind of peddling a simple uh, remediation for that um, I think is somewhat self-delusional. You don't want to have a culture of, of ending people's employment against their will, um, and yet sometimes that's what you have to do. I mean, so it, it, it's really, really tough. Um, and I, I don't know that I'm getting any better at it as I get older. I think it's, it's just very, very difficult. <clears throat> so collaboration uh, has many aspects, and some of them are hard. Um, now, I mentioned the Invisible College. This is a notion uh, that comes from the Middle Ages, kind of. Uh, Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler and company, they would share knowledge by making annotations in books. So back before the printing press, books were this incredibly rare and expensive commodity. And so you have a book that's a, an encoding of rich and hard-earned knowledge. Um, but on top of that, they would put these notes in the margins and sort of share that around. <clears throat> and this became known as the Invisible College. And another um, more formal definition of it is... Uh, unfiltered informal communications produced by communities of people who share an interest in a common subject or discipline. But you can just think it's basically your posse, you know, your group of people that you keep with you in your entire career, even as you switch jobs. A lot of times it's the people that you knew in college if they tended to stay in the field. But uh, being plugged in, not just with strangers, but people that you've known over the years um, and who are all still practitioners, still fighting the fight, um, it's an important thing, and all of the people that have succeeded uh, seem to have this in common. So two of the people from my invisible college, uh, who are also college buddies of mine, uh, Max Levchin on the left there, and Libor Mikulik. Um, <clears throat> Max is uh, probably the most successful uh, entrepreneur that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Uh, he was co-founder of PayPal and just uh, went on to do some important things with Slide and other technologies down the road, and you know now he's a He's the only person I've ever seen that has had his own uh, face done in that uh, stipple art of Wall Street Journal. <laughs> so to me, that's like the biggest mark of success. So if you've 
gotten your own face done in the Wall Street Journal famous uh, stipple art form. Libor is a co-founder of Slide and worked with Max uh, at um, e-groups. No, not at e-groups. Libor was the e-groups. Max was not at e-groups. Um, but they were all friends of mine in, in college. There's generally one or two developers that I think are really awesome that I know personally. And when I have a very specific question about how to do something, I try to rephrase it as the most general question. And then I ask them, and they generally have an answer that's really powerful. And more than likely, I am one of those people for someone else because mm -hmm. I get those questions really, really frequently. And I think it's just enough of a filtering process where, like, the guy who's a CTO at Yelp, who was my chief architect at PayPal, like, super awesome programmer, knows his stuff really well. I don't know if he reads up on a lot of stuff, but he definitely keeps tabs and stuff more than I do. So when I say, how do you do this? He's like, well, you know, here's how Ruby does it. I'm like, okay, well, that's not really about Ruby. It's about how to do yeah. a good pattern for web process. It's a like distributed bullshit detector, though, because yes. you've got yes. all these people you trust, and uh, everyone is an expert in some area or is more interested in areas. There's in areas in which you're generally interested and you will keep up on, and then for all... But it's, you know, it doesn't have to be all of computing and, and the, and yeah, all the other stuff. It's impossible to keep tabs on all of computing. There's Smart. a famous quote from uh, John von Neumann right before his death. He said that back when I was young, it was actually possible to know about half of known math, implying, of course, yeah. that he was one of the people who knew about half of known math. But at this point, I don't even know if anyone understands 10%. I mean, even that, I think, is basically something that indicates increase of bandwidth because people used to write each other letters to exchange math knowledge and by the time John Neumann was old it was actually electronic communication was possible so just the overload of research and collaboration intimidates impossibility of knowing everything therefore one is probably better suited to being an expert in a few fundamental yeah. things than just trying to keep tabs on everything. <coughs> but, and but, having a network. but the other thing is that there's really not that much new on a year-to-year -year basis. There, oh, yeah. So the better your, your bullshit filter or your distributed bullshit filter is, the less you're really going to have to go out of your way. I don't think I've learned anything since school. Although, <laughs> the relationships that you build in bullshit detector are people that you've sweated out some late night hours yeah. hacking, and then you sort of trust them because you've seen how their brain works and it's sufficiently easy for you to model like what they would think is good. So that's the importance of the posse and the individual and invisible college. <clears throat> Another ancient secret, of course, is luck. Um, Rod quipped that competent people tend to be luckier. Um, I talked to Floyd Marinescu. Uh, he was in my category of uh, software pedagogy experts. Floyd was uh, one of the founders of InfoQ <clears throat> and a very successful entrepreneur who has uh, built a career on sharing knowledge, on helping people, running conferences, that sort of thing. Um, Kosuke Kawaguchi is the uh, inventor of Hudson and then now Jenkins. <clears throat> and uh, he has always felt that if you're plugged in and always have some kind of exciting side projects, Hudson started out as just a side project for him, um, being aware of opportunities that come down the pike and having tools that you can deploy to take advantage of those opportunities. I talked to Dave Thomas. Uh, of object-oriented software pioneer. He's founder of OTI, Object Technology Inc., and asked him about uh, luck. Um, luck is always essential. Uh -huh. um, I think um, by my, my nature, I think with, with regard to technology, you have to be a wildly optimistic downside planner. What does that mean? It means that um, you can't bet that the technology is going to take off, is, is going to work going to sell, going to commercialize okay. uh, in the short term. So this basically says that you have to be, you have to tack towards your course. You can't go and get a big injection of VC money and say, okay, we're going to hit the market in three years. Uh -huh. Okay. Now that's it for the uh, ancient secrets. Now onto the modern secrets. These are things that I feel have only recently emerged as useful in the work of a practicing programmer because, let's face it, um, IT is less than 100 years old as a, a career. Um, so mastery of tools, uh, software itself, this is the, the big one, you know, how to write it, fix it, maintain it. This is the technical stuff. Discerning technology trends. Uh, again, the Indivisible College helps with that. Uh, riding the hamster wheel of progress. 
uh, knowing when it's time to change jobs, and importantly, having a non-IT plan B. I think anyone who's in our field um, shouldn't put all of their career eggs in this basket. You should plan on having something else that you do uh, in the case uh, you know, you're not able to do IT anymore. So um, I found that the most successful programmers are often the ones who are the best with their tools. They know all the keyboard shortcuts in IntelliJ. They um, uh, know how to uh, really get the most out of their build systems. Uh, they don't waste time on repetitive tasks because they just have this notion of wanting to smooth out the ripples in their environment. I talked to Chris Wilson, uh, another college pal of mine, and uh, he was uh, at Microsoft at the time. He was the lead architect for Internet Explorer. I, know, I knew Chris because uh, he and I both had the really good fortune to, at college, work on NCSA Mosaic. Um, I had worked on the X and he worked on the Windows. He was one of the two main people who did NCSA Mosaic for Windows. And uh, when Mark Andreessen and all those guys left Illinois to found uh, Mosaic Communications, which later became Netscape, Chris and uh, John Middlehauser, the two um, Windows guys, you know, went over. And, uh, actually, Middlehauser went to Netscape, but Chris went to uh, Microsoft and was the colonel of the old IE team there. Uh, he since also has moved on to Google. You need to know your tools really well. At the same time, that doesn't mean you need to know how to use every single tool perfectly. It's more, I think about it in terms of like being a mechanic or working on your house. Mm -hmm. You need to have a tool that's the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are really heavily into debugging, you need to absolutely understand how to do you know, use your debugging tools extremely deeply and broadly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I also talked to the Java Posse. Does anyone know who the Java Posse is? They were a very popular Java-based podcast uh, a few years ago, um, and I worked with them uh, in the early days of the JSF project, and they've all since moved on to other stuff as well. Uh, but they really had a lot of success with the Java Posse in terms of talking about the Java ecosystem. And they have a mindset of, con he said they have a mindset of continual op optimization. I think a good sign of a developer is someone who's always trying to optimize. And, I, okay. and I discovered this in myself, like in traffic, no one I know thinks the same way about, well, okay, the traffic light pattern is gonna be so, so, and so, so I'm gonna go this way when I'm coming in this direction. I'm, you know what I mean? I have, in my whole neighborhood, mapped out in my head mm -hmm. what the best path You get to make the right <laughs> turn here, here in front of the, yeah. Why should I care really about a minute here, a minute there? It's, I think it's just, it's just a mindset, I think. I'm always thinking of continual optimization. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, coming back to Brian, uh, I asked him how important was it uh, to have pure technical chops, like was just mentioned in the previous slide, versus uh, other kind of soft skills? And um, what does he look for in hires? And here's what he had to say. Yeah, and I think pure technical chops, in many regards, matters the least. Um, I think that um, disposition, work ethic, um, ability to work in a team, um, hu humility, uh, the ability to, ins to understand complicated systems is in some regards more important than the overconfidence to change them hastily. People get surprised by our review process because I'm not really actually interested in asking you how to balance a red black tree. In order to succeed, you need to have the ability to, more than anything, you've got to have the ability to grind. You've got to have the ability to be persistent when you are just getting punched in the face metaphorically. I really am interviewing more for intrinsic motivation for the problems that we have. So you have to have enough technical chops to have an appreciation for, for what you don't know, I think is the most important thing. Okay, so um, if you have ever attended any of Brian Cantrell's talks, uh, he's a very good speaker, very entertaining and energetic speaker, but a lot of his themes are war stories from uh, various outages they've had at Joyent. So when he talks about that you have to be able to grind it out and be uh, able to be persistent when you're just getting punched in the face, he knows from experience it's like, you know, customers are losing money and, you know, you're getting uh, called on the pager and, and it's, uh, no one knows what it's doing. And, you know, of course, with the huge complicated stack that is Node and NPM, uh, anyone remember uh, left shift and NPM gate? 
Um, it's a very uh, sort of delicate balance of things. So he has a lot of experience in fighting through those things, and he wants to bring people into the team that also can make it through that process. Um, Andy Hunt talks about the software safety net. This comprises mastery of version control, competitive unit tests, um, and I would add to that nowadays, you know, experience with uh, CI and cloud deployment pipelines. That's a, another important aspect of the software safety net. I talked to Linda Rising. Uh, she is very famous in the patterns community, um, and she had some insights on writing patterns that are used and successful um, to encapsulate them and, and deploy them in an uh, enterprise context. Context right. is, is what we say in the in patterns lingo mm -hmm. is there's a context and that's a difficult part of the pattern to write because you can have a great idea mm -hmm. and yes it might have worked for you but you might not really understand the real context of your own pattern because you've only seen it in the context that you know right. in fact novice pattern writers suffer from context that are not focused. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to have it reviewed by a lot of different people. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, productivity. This one is an important thing. Where does the productivity, productivity come from? Uh, if you've been in the industry long enough, you can uh, observe that over time, the amount of effort needed to get a given output done, a given kind of project done, has decreased as more and more stuff gets encapsulated into frameworks and tools and languages. So here's their comments on that. I think that's one of the big unwritten stories of the last 10 years is in writing software is the just insane product, uh, productivity revolution. It's look, a team 10 years ago now can be cranked out by a person or two rather than to what do you attribute this big boost? I think it's open source and also the new more advanced, the new languages, the whole host of you know, so Python, Ruby, okay. uh, to some extent some of the other ones. Obviously, you know, there's the whole Lisp story, but just you know, high level, high level languages and open source software mm -hmm. to run it on. Okay. So my personal experience with this very recently is. Um, when I give my talk later today about this cloud serverless state service, um, we are moving an Oracle uh, from focusing a lot and heavily on Java to also now having uh, the ability to interact with our software in other languages. So Go is one of them, for example. And uh, this is an excellent book on Go uh, by Kernighan and Donovan. And <clears throat> I was shocked. I just had a little moment of pause when in chapter four, uh, they have exercises at the end of the chapter. And one little exercise they have is just this. Create a web server that queries GitHub once and then allows navigation of the list of bug reports, milestones, and users. So to be able to just flippantly say as an exercise in a book, do this, and actually have it be a reasonable request um, is pretty remarkable because if you go back five, seven years, you would see that and like, oh, okay, well, I better go hire a team and learn you know, how to do all that, uh, the fact that productivity has advanced uh, is very striking in that regard. Another important modern secret is being able to spot technology trends. Now, I talked to uh, Dave uh, about this topic in 2008, and we were talking about the cloud. And 2008 is you know, almost 10 years ago now, but in fact, his prediction was actually correct. So let's see, uh, ask Dave how, uh, when will the cloud hit the big time? You, you got it today. Okay. Google, Amazon, Salesforce, you know, may not providing general purpose capabilities, but they're, you know, the proof that it works is there. You've got a simple set of APIs that you can write any application you want, and that lets an application team deploy an application independently. No stupid object middleware, there's no app server, none of that crap, there's no mainframe, none of those barriers are there. Uh -huh. So how long will it be before this paradigm has a uh, general influence on the way. Max 10 years. So that was spot on. Now, another aspect of this is Kubernetes. Is anyone doing anything with Kubernetes here yet? Well, if you're not now, you probably will very soon. Um, what I'm seeing at Oracle is uh, we've put a lot of uh, effort into embracing Kubernetes. We have a new product coming out called Oracle Kubernetes Engine. 
and it's going to let you run your Oracle workflows on, on cloud Kubernetes. In fact, I'll show a demo of that later today. <clears throat> so this gentleman here is Brendan Burns. He is one of three uh, co-founders of the Kubernetes project. And um, I asked him, again, why was, what was the reason for Kubernetes' explosive growth? And I think his answer explo explores how to look at an existing trend and ask why it happened. Why did it become po so popular? Um, I, mean, I think you can extend this to a degree to the container ecosystem in general, and I think okay. it's because I think it's because we've seen uh, the cloud take off in significant ways, um, and yet I don't think that the tools for managing and deploying applications kept pace with the um, the flexibility and power that cloud was offering, uh, mm -hmm. and so people were sort of overextended. Um, with some um, of the more traditional DevOps tools. Um, and so containers uh, and then Kubernetes really exploded in popularity because they fit, uh, they, they address some pain points that, that people have. And I think one of the other reasons is that they fit pain points that everyone has, mm -hmm. from IT administrators to developers to CTOs. They, they, they just hit all of these different pain points. Um, and so it was one of those rare moments where I think everyone was aligned in, in, and got a win out of, out of it, right? Um, and so I think when that happens, you see rapid adoption. Um, I would say with Kubernetes in particular, um, we put a tremendous amount of effort into building a really open, welcoming uh, community and a, a community that, was, that, that really tried to embrace everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a ton of effort put into that early on. Um, and, and, and a really a big tent ecosystem. Um, I think that has also been one of the reasons it's, it's been successful is because we really approached it with a humble um, approach and, uh, and an open uh, approach to how you build uh, one of these communities. Okay. Uh, again, sticking with the theme of spotting trends, I asked Andy Hunt, um, <clears throat> what does he th see as a next possible big trend in computing? This one really hasn't played out yet, but I'm still not convinced that it won't. Here's my thought on that, and I have no idea if this is actually going to work this way or not, but it strikes me that there is a, a real aspect of the cobbler's children having no shoes here. Um, if you look at any of our popular computer languages today, Gutenberg could print, <laughs> you know, virtually any computer program in use, in computer language program in use today. It could be, I mean, it's that basic, that simple. And it occurs to me, in a lot of environments, given the richness of what we're trying to express, that that's a pretty poor model. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that there's, there's an awful lot of opportunity there for a far richer expression of programming constructs, you know, and I'm not talking necessarily just about graphical programming or, you know, uh, boxes and lines and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but, you know, something more along the lines of, of interacting in, say, Second Life or, mm -hmm. you know, some, some very rich virtual uh, environment like that um, uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, the fact that, you know, writing programs in black and white text seems pretty limiting bandwidth-wise. That, that's a waste of bandwidth. So uh, one aspect I think that that prediction has kind of come true, and <clears throat> I'll talk to Brendan Burns about this further down the line, is dealing with logs. <clears throat> in a cloud world, uh, it's no longer sufficient to just look at your log files in a text editor. You now have to use some kind of log visualizer because there's so many of them, something like uh, Kibana, for example. Um, <clears throat> so that's not like what he was talking about were Second Life and VR, but you, you are stepping away from the code and using a tool to do more of data science analysis on the things. <clears throat> so I asked Brendan, this is a hamster wheel of progress, um, will the increasing amount of automation of the cloud cause CS to be a less viable career choice? Uh, I mentioned uh, it takes a couple programmers to do now what it would take a whole team to do 10 years ago, or five years ago even, uh, given that you need fewer people, does that mean there's going to be fewer jobs? And uh, Brendan thought that was a bit of a silly question, so let's hear what his answer is. Uh, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I, I mean, I think, the history of com I think the history of computing is that every time you build an abstraction layer, right. people simply build more applications. 
okay. and, and build more interesting applications. Um, and so you could say that you know the development of, of web technologies and JavaScript and things like that that enabled a whole bunch of people to become developers. Um, I don't think anybody would argue that that somehow, uh, by becoming easier, reduced the number of developers we had in the world. In fact, I'd say it actually magnified it. Um, okay. So I would flip it around and actually say, I think that the real challenge and the real opportunity the cloud presents for business is uh, the opportunity to build better systems mm -hmm. uh, with the people who they have. Right? I think that with Kubernetes, you're, you're doing things like automatic health check. You don't have to teach someone. I guess another way of saying this is you don't have to teach someone that they need to put a wrapper around their application to keep it alive if it happens to crash with mm -hmm. Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes just does that for you. Right. right? Uh, there's all of this automation. Maybe another analogy would be that I use often is, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had a remote control plane, mm -hmm. and that remote control plane flew for a grand total of about 10 seconds before I flew it into the ground mm -hmm. where it died. Right. And, and my children now have a quadcopter drone that they fly from the iPad around the house. Right. Right. And the reason that that's possible is because there's automation. Right. There's computers that are assisting people to get their jobs done. Um, I don't think that we've lost anything. In fact, I would argue that we've gained a lot via that automation. Um, and because my people can focus on the interesting parts of the job, not on the nuts and bolts of how do I reliably deploy a new service into my environment. Right. <clears throat> okay. So um, I uh, followed up with a question about uh, Kubernetes could be seen as an evolution of the app server. <clears throat> you know, I come from the app, app, app server world, WebLogic and Java EE, and uh, I asked, what does is, what is he think of some advice from app server developers moving to Kubernetes and moving into the cloud? In many cases, the things that you learn there still apply, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're still writing multi-threaded programs. I think that the biggest challenge is, is wrapping your head around how do you debug and deploy when there's lots of replicas of the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to start learning some tools that do things like aggregate logs. Right? Mm -hmm. It's no longer OK to just log into a machine and dump its logs. Now you need to have a tool right. that aggregates all of the logs across a bunch of different servers into one. And then because of the volume, do querying. So you, 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 your problem has become one of more of a data scientist than a uh, uh, than just a person who's a developer reading, reading log lines. <clears throat> okay. Um, another rock star skill was getting a new idea adopted. You uh, have a great idea, but how do you get the world to use it? I asked James this, and he said, well, his biggest success was getting the banking industry to use automatic garbage collection. <clears throat> Nikhil had a really good insight, which is how to enable the consumers of the platform to make money, to build something that allows creating uh, a most tangible representation of value, which is money. Finally, um, business acumen and career. I asked Adrian, how far can you progress just being a good programmer? If you, want, you don't want to be manager, you don't want to be a product evangelist or anything, you just want to do write and code. How far can you go with that? It was always a great tension and still is. I remember inside IBM and it, you see it replicated all over the place. It's kind of like, hmm. how far can you just being a really good programmer. Right. Um, and that's always one of these classic questions. Um, and for a few very exceptional individuals, but probably as a percentage an incredibly tiny one, simply being an outstanding programmer will get you an incredibly long way. But for most people, that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. um, certainly for me, you know, beyond just that individual being a great programmer, what really matters at the next level is can that person actually make a really great team? Because an individual on their own is you know, only so good. So can I, which means that you can start thinking about things like their communication skills and all the rest of it come into play and actually are very important. Um, as you progress through the ranks, I mean, really think if you, in any company of any size, to understand and have an appreciation of at least the interplay between business and technology mm -hmm. and how technology decisions impact your options in business and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That's a really important space to have a grasp on. And in general, people who can understand that about tend to progress faster and further than people who can't or are just not interested. <clears throat> so the, the understanding the business side, the important thing there. 
Um, since we're running out of time, I'm going to skip through. We had to start a bit later. Uh, finally, the non-IT plan B. Um, having a no, non-IT plan B is an important rock star skill. Um, he, Adrian there, said it you know, wouldn't have a high-powered career. He'd like to be a forest ranger. Uh, some people from the Java Posse uh, would like to write uh, novels or uh, race cars. And in fact, some of them have done that. Uh, so that's our conclusion. Um, and I'll leave this slide up there. And uh, if you want to learn more about this, um, I'm going to find a space outside and you can talk to me and take a look at the book and get a copy if you like. And thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day at Code Europe.